Thank you for being here. A welcome to our visitors. Glad you are with us, worshiping with us, and glad to be together in the house of God. You know, as I was um, thinking of my message this morning, I was telling the Sunday school that a couple weeks ago I was sitting in church uh, during a message, and the Lord gave me a message right there. And I was like, okay, how is this going to work? But as I started studying, I was so blessed this morning when I came to church, when I uh, looked at the Sunday school lesson at home, and realized that God had been working in me the last number of weeks uh, on a message that connected and tied into what the Sunday school lesson was directly with the devotional. And then also this evening, as I thought about us going to the Behalt, um, In the last year, I've had the privilege to be in at the Behalt twice, and I've been really blessed. The first time was when um, Muhammad came to visit me. He's a Muslim man who put in his GPS to go to the Walnut Creek Flea Market or the Berlin Flea Market, and his truck brought him in, his GPS brought him in my driveway, and then he hit my parking lot, And it said, you have arrived. Now, I'm not a flea market, though it does look like that sometimes around there. Uh, But I I don't know what the Lord was doing, but I knew it was a divine appointment that I was to spend that evening with Muhammad uh, with our family. And the next morning, him and I went to see the Behalt together. And it was such a a special privilege. So I want to... Just make sure that each of you recognize the privilege we have here in this community uh, to have this history of our people and the opportunity. You get to come free tonight. So, like, yeah, I had to pay for it that time with Muhammad. So tonight you get in free, so come on over. Um, But I just, I just, I was really blessed with the fact that you know, we're, we're going to be doing this. And the title of my message this morning is Building Godly Values in Our Lives. And I want to share this message because I believe that we live in a time and a day and age where if we do not have values in our lives and we don't have convictions and believe what we're doing, that we will end up being washed away by the flood that is coming through. And, and there is a flood. There is a flood of media. You are bombarded and I am bombarded with more messages and more influence every day than ever in the history of the world. You see more information probably in a 24-hour period than most people who have lived out their lives in the history of the world. We get to see it, and we are influenced. And believe me, if we are not built on values, we're going to be washed away. I'm going to use for my, um, my message this morning a story from the Old Testament. My text is in Jeremiah chapter 35. So if you would, turn with me to chapter uh, 35 of Jeremiah. And I just want to read this story. It's a, it's a story about uh, Jeremiah working with the people, a people group called the Rechabites. Beginning to read in verse 1, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them, And bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of a Messiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wines, 
wine and cups. And I said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build a house, build house nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed, but we have dwelt in tents." And have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon came up into the land that we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for the fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for the fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah saying, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel. Go tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction and hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine are performed, for unto this day they drink none. But obey their father's commandment, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early, and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of, Reco of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and have kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not have want, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story in the Old Testament, how there's an example for us to follow of people who honored you and honored who they were, and we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. Thank you for your presence here already today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this story uh, is not this morning going to be a sermon about not drinking wine. Uh, this is far greater, though that is what was commanded here in, in the scripture. Uh, from, from the children of Rechab. So I want to take a look at who the people in this story were. There were there was three different people here that I want to take a look at, and Jeremiah the prophet is the first one. And we've just come through the study of Jeremiah in our Sunday school. And uh, Irvin, thank you for sharing that scripture this morning of Jeremiah. Who was he? So he was a prophet in the time of Israel. He was a prophet during the time of Josiah and his two sons. So Josiah was the king. He had two sons, uh, Zedekiah and Jehoiakim. And both of those sons sat on the throne. They did not have a successor beyond them. And we'll get into that, why that was. But he was a prophet during this time. He experienced a lot of tragedy. The verse this morning that Irvin brought to us that he was considered very young, uh, one commentator m mentioned that he was probably 17 to 20 years old 
when the word of the Lord came to him. So I got a question. Any 17 to 20 year olds there in the back that would like to come finish the sermon this morning? Because you know, God does speak to you all. And it's never too young to start. Jeremiah was called to this work when he was in this young age. Very young, 17, 20 years old. And he said, look, I'm young and I can't speak. But we know what God came back to him in Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Here's the beauty of God's work in his kingdom. You might look out today and say, you know, our situation in the world, uh, there's a lot of indicators that things could be happening that could be prophecy. We, we see the tree, like Jesus said, he said, when you see the fig tree and you see the leaves coming, uh, you know that the time is getting near. I have said sometimes since I live back here in Ohio that I think the coming of the Lord is like spring in Ohio. You get days where the sun comes out and it's bright and sunny and you think spring is here. Then the snow comes again in the first day of May. And no, spring's not here after all. And then finally later on spring comes in Ohio. The day of the Lord is is like that we can see that the tree is budding. I think we look around and we can tell that the tree is budding. And I think it's more important today than ever that we are rooted, just as Jeremiah was. And let me say to this crowd here, the front benches, the in the back, if you are a young person and you receive a word, Samuel was 12 years old in our in our lesson today you are never too young to receive a word from the lord and to begin your work with god as a young person don't wait well i got to get married and i got to i got to be established i got to have this in line no the work of the lord comes first so god calls uh young people so jeremiah was young do you know all that jeremiah went through in the one point the lord told jeremiah go make yokes and put a yoke on your neck. Walk around with a yoke on your neck. Imagine one of the young, well, they about, there are young people out there that wear yokes on their necks these days. Um, but imagine young people walking in a church with a yoke on their neck one Sunday morning. And we're like, what are you doing that for? Well, the Lord's saying that you guys are going to be led away with yokes on your necks. These are the things that Jeremiah had to do. He was thrown into a, a pit in an old well. And when he got down, he sunk into the mire up to his waist. That's how deep the mire was in the pit that Jeremiah was thrown into for bringing the word of the Lord to the people. I don't know how long he was there, but he did not get pulled out right away. He stood in the mire up to his waist for a time for bringing the word of God to his people. So he was a man that suffered greatly. Jehoiakim at the time was the king. He is the other character in this story. He was a very wicked king in Judah. And if you go to chapter 36 of Jeremiah, this story happens of the Rechabites just before we get to chapter 36, which is the story where Jeremiah told Barak to write the words of God on a parchment, on a scroll, and take it to the king. In chapter 36, you will read the story how Jeremiah sent Barak to them. The people read the words. They realized these words are the words of judgment. We're scared. Hide Jeremiah, and then we'll go take it to the king. Jehoiakim was sitting in his winter house. He had a fire on the hearth. And as they read the, as they read the scroll to him, he got his pen knife out. And we take two or three leaves and cut them out and throw them in the fire. They'd read a few more pages. He'd cut those out and throw them in the fire. This is how, how much this king ignored the word of God. Very similar to how we see people today ignoring the word of God. The very truth of God's word is in our hands. 
uh, someone in our Sunday school said this morning, the Bible, and this is true, is the best-selling book of all times. There are many, many Bibles in the world today, but people ignore the Word of God, just like Jehoiakim did in that day. So this was the king. This wicked king was the king that was, was king when this story happened. The third characters are the Rechabites. Now these people lived nomadic lives. They were shepherds and keepers of flocks. So they moved around the countryside with their sheep and they took their tents. They did not build houses. They were the sons of Jonadab. And if you get together in a gathering here, I sit, I was gone long enough that all these franchises, we were sitting in a small group leader yesterday meeting yesterday and we were trying to figure out who someone was and all the different Freinschafts that were floating around had my head spinning. Um, I, I just don't follow it quite as well. If I want to get oriented, I go over to mom's house and I sit down with her and she orients me uh, on the Freinschafts. But this, was, this is important in our community. You want to know who someone is. You want to follow, oh yeah, they come from so and so. Well, Jonadab, he was, his dad was Rechab, as we read. But Rechab was a descendant of the Kenites. And the Kenites come from Jethro. Anybody know who Jethro was in the scripture? The father-in-law of a famous man. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. These were his descendants. So they, Midian came with Moses and the children of Israel through the, through the wilderness and traveled with them. And his descendants were the Kenites. And Rechab was the father of Jonadab. Now, what makes Jonadab significant? Jonadab was the man that Jehu tapped on the shoulder to say, Come with me. Ride in my chariot. You ever hear this? Drive like Jehu? Uh, yeah. Jehu drove like a wild man. And he was on a mission. And he was called to destroy the wickedness of Jezebel. And Jonadab rode and went with Jehu. So Jonadab was the father that gave these commands to his family. And I'd like to think, and I really do think, that it came from the fact that he was part of destroying the wickedness of Jezebel. He saw what being drawn into the world was. And these Rechabites settled in the area around Jericho, uh, where Jericho had been. So they had a long history. And by the time Jeremiah brought them into the temple, they had been keeping this for 300 years. So they had done what their father told them for 300 years. So let's take a look at godly values and conviction this morning. Um, the definition of values, uh, the noun of it simply means it's the price of something. So if something has a value, it is the price of it. If you value something as a verb and take an action with it, it simply means that you esteem it very highly or you prize it. So a value is something you esteem very highly. Uh, a conviction is a strong belief. Or the feeling of being sure what you believe or say is true. If you believe what you are that you, what you are believing and what you are saying is true, that is a conviction. So I want to take a look at four things that we can see about a godly value in this story. Number one is a godly value is something that you will keep because you realize its worth. If a family heirloom is handed down to you, uh, I know there are some collectors in this crowd. And when you as a collector go to an auction and you see something being bid on and you know 
it's not reaching its value, your hand is probably quick to go up. Because you know the value of what's there, and you know the price that should be paid for that, and if you can get it and get it into your possession, you're going to be happy because you know its value. I believe that a godly value is like that. You will know its worth. Notice the Rechabites. Because of Jonadab, their father working with Jehu destroy the wickedness of Jezebel, they understood, they clearly understood what value that this, uh, how much it was worth. Jonadab gave these instructions. This was a first-hand experience for Jonadab. And I think that's another thing that gives something value. You cannot live off of your father's or your mother's righteousness. You have to have a first-hand experience with Jesus Christ in order for you to have an experience. It is not a handed-down experience with the Lord. If the values are going to continue in your family and my family, we each have to experience the salvation of Jesus Christ firsthand. That is something that's very important. This morning we heard a testimony of a man who experienced God firsthand. And God is at work. In this day and age, God is at work. And I am so excited that we can be part of a body of believers, that, that we see God at work in our lives. It must be a firsthand experience. You can't live off of your parents' righteousness or react to their unfaithfulness. You know, some of us... Or some of you, some, some people, have hurts from our parents, maybe at times. Do we react to that? Do we blame them for where we are? Well, I'm that way because, you know, my dad was that way. Is that, is that how we live? We cannot blame other people. It's a firsthand experience. Um, and I don't mean to diminish that there are times that people go through things in family and hurts and have to go find healing for them. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I understand that there are times that we need to do that. But we can't live off of their righteousness or make the excuse that we're this way because of our past. It is a firsthand experience for each believer. So a godly value, we understand its worth. Here's another thing that a godly value has. It is something that is clear and can be followed by those who come behind us. You know, sometimes it's difficult to have clear expectations and clear standards that we live by in our lives. It's a little easier just to kind of float along and, yeah, we'll kind of take it as it comes. You know, if we feel like doing this, we'll do this. That's how the world is living today. Jonadab's instructions were very specific. Do not drink wine. Do not build houses. Do not sow seed or have vineyards. And dwell in tents. His children followed those. They were clear. We're often afraid to lay out clearly values, clear values because the most difficult person to lead is always yourself. You are always the most difficult person to lead. I am always the most difficult person to lead. Because I can have standards for others, but when we sit at the dinner table and they're like, well, Dad, you got to do that. Now nah, let's all be calm here, right? You know. Yes, we have to lead ourselves as well. And having clear values, our families, our children know whether it's just something we say or if it's something we do. And we have to be able to articulate what we believe. Can you and I clearly speak about what we stand for? Can we clearly live what we stand for? So something, a godly value is something that is clear and can be followed. Another aspect of a godly value is it does not change because of circumstances. A conviction that you have 
or a belief that you have or a value does not change because of circumstance. Notice the Rechabites. They could no longer be in the countryside because the army of the Chaldeans had come in and it was too dangerous to live out there. So they moved into Jerusalem. As they were there in Jerusalem, God sent this command to Jeremiah and said, Look, bring them in. Because they couldn't live in tents, they still held their standard. When the wine was placed in front of them by even a godly man. You know, sometimes we can be deceived. There are many people online today preaching, preaching. There are many things being said out there. Just because it's coming from a good source, are you going back to the Word of God and looking in the Word of God to see, is that true? They said, no, we won't have that wine that you've set in front of us because we don't do that. What about you and I? Are you one way at church? Am I one way at church and then another way away from church and at home? What about when you go on vacation? Like one man said, what happens in Florida stays in Florida, right? Is that how life is? You know, is our, our values, yeah, I know we go away, we relax. There's nothing wrong with that. But do you turn into a completely different person when you don't think anyone that you're connected to is going to see you? Or are your values part of your life and they journey with you no matter where you go? A value has that. It doesn't change because of a change of circumstance. The fourth point about a value is that it brings a blessing. And we often look at values as in terms uh, and blessings in terms of financial blessings, having a good life. But I had to think about the deepest blessing we can get in our lives are the fruits of the Spirit. The richest blessings you can experience are not physical, but they are spiritual. They are the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You can't even make a law to make you behave yourself if you have these things in you. You don't need a law. There's no law out there that's needed for the fruit of the Spirit. The richest blessing you can have is the fruit of the Spirit. The blessing that, that God pronounced in the Rechabites was this, that they would never have a man lacking to stand before them, him. If you ever, it came to my mind as I was studying do you ever think about who God came to first with the angels at the birth of Jesus? I have no proof that they were Rechabites, but they were shepherds. The angel came to the shepherds first. And it just hit me how there is always a blessing in our lives when we are willing to seek the values God has. God has promised he will always have a remnant. He will always have a remnant of people who will be faithful and true to him no matter what goes. He has promised that through all of ages. Are you and I part of that remnant? Jehoiakim, in contrast, ignored the word of God and destroyed it. And he was told he would not have another son to be on the throne. His generation was erased. The Rechabites were built for a long time. So that brings me to the last point, is how do you build these in your life? And as I was studying, I came across um, a diagram that I want to share this morning. Maren, if you'll pull that up, that really blessed me. In teaching our ch children, we'll get this up here in a minute.
I told Myron, if it gets too close to my head, I, I can't think, so he has to be careful there. Um, I don't have any hair to protect me. That's probably the... So if you look at this diagram, if... Um, Can you see that? Okay. So what you have here is something that blessed me, and i got to give credit to Corey M. Carlson, the, a book that I was reading called Winning at Home. And I, I thought to myself, this is something that I have often failed in, but there's two arrows here pointing. One is an invitation to relationship, and the other is challenge to responsibility. And I think as parents, this is what we're called to. We are called to give an invitation to relationship and to challenge to responsibility. And as you can see, there's four quadrants here. So the first quadrant we're going to look at is, let's see if we get, okay. So the first quadrant, you have no invitation to relationships and no challenge to responsibility. This is the child that's just left to do their thing. A lot of times they may be on a device and they're not bothering you and they're fine. They're sitting in a corner with a device and your life's pretty good and their life's pretty good. And there's no interaction. And I think sometimes in today's era, we as parents can be pretty guilty of this. I know devices make nice little babysitters. But let me tell you, the price to be paid in the long run is not going to be healthy. Uh, a child that's going through that is going to feel experiences of isolation. And, and think about somebody growing up as an isolated person, what they're going to experience. And I had to think about this. Let's put this in the context of having family devotions. You know, the family that has, that where dad is never initiating any relationship, any time sitting down in the home of having family devotions with his children, those children are going to feel isolated spiritually. They're going to wonder where to get their answers spiritually. Then in the other quadrant, you have, this is all challenge to responsibility and no invitation to relationship. This is, you wait till dad comes home and it's going to be... Or dad comes home and says, you better get this done right now. And unfortunately, I've dwelt in all four of these quadrants and rarely in the right one <laughs> as a parent. So don't, don't look at me up here and say, well, Judd, he's trying to tell us how to parent. Look, when I had the first guy to challenge was myself. But the response of these children is going to be little soldiers. They're going to perform when you're around because they're afraid of what happens if nothing. If you're, if you're there. But when they go to Florida, what happens in Florida is going to stay in Florida. You're not going to know what happens. The values are not going to go with them. They might perform for you. But will there be a, there's no relationship. The third quadrant to look at is all invitation to relationship, no challenge to responsibility. And let me tell you something. We talk about the family. Let's go back to family devotions here. You know, no, no interaction, nothing is going to leave spiritually isolated children. Sitting down every day, you better sit still and read the Word of God, and you're going to sit while I read here is going to lead to little soldiers. But just sitting around and never challenging them and always just catering to them you know, it's going to end up being spoiled. Now, believe me, that moment in church where your child acts up and you get up to go out and somehow the whole church gets silent. You feel very alone. Your head is very red. All of you can laugh and know. I've gone out the aisle with a child announcing to the whole church, don't spank me, don't spank me, don't spank me. And everyone in church heard it. So, Parents, keep up the good work. Keep going out. Keep doing the good work. When you stand up, it's okay. It's totally okay. You're challenging them to responsibility. We've, we go through the process. But if, 
if you're only focused on relationship and no challenge to responsibility, you're going to have spoiled children. The fourth quadrant, then, is the one that we want to strive to be in, and this is loving invitation to relationship and loving challenge to responsibility. And here is what what we want to experience. Children who are loved and are growing. And, you know, honestly, it's just like all of us, when we go about to do something, it doesn't, it doesn't, nothing, there are some things that just totally come naturally. But most things in life that you're going to be successful at, you have to practice. You have to stay with it. Some of us, you know, are in the stage of life right now where it's the young children, it takes all the energy you have, and you're shaping and molding. And I just want to say, God bless you. Keep it up. Don't give up. Um, you know, our children need to know at home, and yes, we need to read Bible stories to them, we need to read stuff, but are you teaching your children to sit still and listen to the Word of God? Your family may only be able to handle three minutes, but do they know to honor the Word of God? Do they know to sit still when you read the Bible to them? Because they need to understand like Mark preached, to have a love for the Word of God. And the Word of God is not honored in our society very highly. So keep shaping, keep molding, don't quit. It's very important. Some of you are where we are. We're still trying to shape a few and letting go of others. And boy, it gets muddy in that mix, let me tell you. We don't always get it done right. We kind of forget to keep shaping. The older ones remind us, boy, the younger ones are getting off the hook. You gave us all the stuff... Any parents ever hear that before? The young ones all get off the hook. Well, I think we get kind of in the middle of the road and we kind of get tired of shaping young ones and ready to let go of old ones. Um, And and we're kind of caught in there. So some of us are there. We're in the middle of, of things. And then some of you are at the stage where they're out of the house. Now what do you do? Some of you are at the grandparent stage. And let me tell you, you are at the most important stage. And that is the prayer. And each stage prayer is most important. But I believe that my life, my grandma Schrock slash Yoder, who lived beside us, watched a lot of things and couldn't say and tell us what to do. But I know there were many, many hours spent praying for us. And I credit those prayers for God working in my life. I really do. Do not stop praying for your children and grandchildren. It is the most important work of the kingdom of God is prayer. The most important work of the kingdom of God is prayer. And we sometimes forget that. So I just want to bless each one of you. No matter what stage you are, no matter where you are, keep building godly values. Keep building a heritage that will stand. Will the values you have today, if the Lord tarries 300 years, stand like they did for the Rechabites? What are you putting into people's lives? And what godly values do people see in your life that they want to follow? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word and the example of the Rechabites. We pray that each one of us could follow you in the path that you have called us right now, that we be faithful. Bless each family and each person here, whether young or old, married or single, whatever the role in life, Lord, would you bless them and help us all to build those values that others can walk along behind. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.